I'm going to start off by asking you uh, to state your name, when and where you were born, and the names of your parents and what they did, and then I'll prompt you with some of the other things. Well, now this business is about where I was born. Mm -hmm. Well, my parents were living on a farm in the boondocks of Fort Cure County when I was expected. And I think my mother must have had trouble having my brother, who is older than I. So they moved into Washington to be near a hospital. I was born, they moved back to Fort Cure. And after I got old enough to realize what had happened to me, and bold enough to say to them, that you've only done one mean thing to me in all my life, and that was to have me in Washington rather than Virginia. So yes, I was born in Washington, D.C. That's something I can't live down, <laughs> but I still consider myself a Virginian. So where, do you know the hospital in which you were born? Sibley Hospital in Washington, D.C. Oh. So I assume that the that the delivery went well, and your memories are really in Virginia. Oh, sure, yeah. So now, give me the names of your parents. My father was William Temple Carrico. My mother was Nellie Nadalia Willett. Um, I had three sisters and a brother. Uh, my youngest little sister died at age 22 months. She was the sweetest little thing you've ever seen, and it was a tragic loss. She had an intestinal infection. That was before the days of antibiotics. An uncle by marriage of mine was involved in the drug business. He worked for one of the major drug companies in the United States and his company introduced sulfur drug into this country. It came from Germany. It was about two years too late though for my little sister. But we were a close-knit family. Uh, in 1919, my parents moved from Fork here to Fairfax County on a dairy farm between Annandale and Bailey's Crossroads. We were eight miles from the city of Washington on what's known as Columbia Pike, which is one of the main roads in and out of Washington. I saved my father around in Dury. Columbia Pike was a dirt road then. The paved road came out from Washington only about halfway. And in the winter time, the road would get so bad that the milk truck couldn't get in there to pick up the milk to take to the Dury in Washington and add it to his milk check every month. When the milk truck couldn't get in there, he just had to pour the milk out on the ground and the milk truck went down by that much. But I loved that farm. When he sold it, I, it just broke my heart. I couldn't understand how some would, would get rid of something that wonderful. And uh, since How old I've, were you? Hmm? How old were you? I was 13 when he, he got rid of it. And uh, later, when I got older, I realized that dairy farming is the very hardest work there is. Those cows have to be milked twice a day, same time each day. And you have to be there whether you feel like being there or not. And uh, it is just hard, hard work. That's all there is to it. And a lot of other problems, too. We didn't have electricity or telephone for years living there. And everything had to be done by hand. And all the work on the farm had to done by, be done by horses. Uh, no power equipment or anything like that. But it, as I say, it was a wonderful farm. And uh, uh, if I could buy it back today, uh, which I couldn't because the property has become extremely valuable in Fairfax County, as you know. But it was a wonderful place. So were you busy working on the farm as well as a young? Oh, yes. We all had to help out. My father really was a good psychologist. To cool the milk, 
uh, you put the milk in the vat and it rolls down over something that looks like a washboard uh, and then into the milk can where it's shipped. And to cool it, you pump water that goes inside that ripple thing. And we had to pump that by hand. And my father told me when I got to be six years old, he was going to let me pump the water to cool the milk. I couldn't wait. Then he told me when I got to be seven, I could strip the cows. That meant going long after the milker had gotten through, but left some milk, and you have to get all that out. So I was allowed to strip. And then when I got to be eight, he was going to let me milk the cows. I couldn't wait. <laughs> now, my brother was five years older than I was, and he didn't buy all that. He hated every minute of it. So you all were very different in what you wanted. Uh -huh. Now, what, what was your brother interested in? Well, he went to UVA, and he made grades that may not have been equal since, especially in the sciences. Uh, it was hard for him because uh, that was the Great Depression that was on then. And between his third and fourth year, he got a job with an outfit called Standard Brands, which is a national organization that sells food products. And we go around to different stores, markets, and so forth. And it was paid very good money, so he decided that he'd work the next winter, the next year, and go back for his fourth year and save enough money that he wouldn't have to bother uh, working during that fourth year. He never went, went back for that fourth year. And wow. it's something he regretted all of his life. He became a builder and uh, was an extremely good builder, but uh, uh, I, I think he regretted not getting his college education. Where did he eventually settle? In in. Fairfax County. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now you said your father sold the, the dairy farm. What did he do after that? Well, a number of things. When the Depression came along, he, he, my father was uh, something of an artist. And uh, he worked for the General Outdoor Advertising Company. He would draw the pictures that you saw on billboards. Mm. And when the Depression hit, he lost his job. And he was always a great horseman. So he built a stable with 18 stalls and bought 18 horses. And he somehow had a contact with the French embassy. I, I, if I knew, I don't remember how he made it. But they apparently had enough money that they could afford to come out and pay to ride horses. And uh, so he sort of fed us with that. Now, it was my job uh, to come home after school and muck those 18 stalls. And if you don't know what muck is, just use your imagination. <laughs> I still like horses. It's a wonder I do after that experience. So you were happier at the dairy farm than you were yeah, yeah. Mucking, with, mucking the horse stalls. But my father made a full-sized horse out of wood and metal, taking a jump, which he put out at the end of our driveway to advertise the riding club. And it was so real that people in the automobiles would slow down, afraid the horse would jump in front of him. Wow, that's amazing. So did he do anything else with this particular artistic talent? Well, no, but he... Well, one thing he did, and I regret so much that I don't have one of them, the uh, Prince William Chamber of Commerce, Prince William County, decided they wanted to equal Winchester with the Apple Blossom Festival. They wanted to put on uh, a dairy festival every year. And one year they asked my dad, the, the, one year the Fairfax County Chamber of Commerce asked my dad to paint two pictures of the six colonial homes, Mount Vernon, Woodbridge, and so forth, Woodlawn. Woodlawn is the home that George Washington built for his stepdaughter, Nellie Custis. So my father prepared 12 full-sized 
pictures of those homes, one to go on each side of a truck for a float in the parade. And they were used for several years. I'd love to have one of those now. I'm sure they were thrown in some shed and ultimately destroyed. They were beautiful, they really were. Do you know what happened to the horse that your your father constructed or sculpted? He got torn down after he, mm. he got out of that. He uh, he went into building too, with my brother. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let me back up a little bit and ask you a little bit about your um, formative years in school. What? Uh, I assume that you went to uh, a local public school that was in this farming community? Yes. So tell me a little bit about what... Well, I went to Bailey's Crossroads School, which a common, was a combination of grade school and high school. Uh, I was a little bit closer to Annandale, but that was just a one-room school. Uh, before I finished grade school, though, they got a full-size uh, school at Annandale and, and I went to that and that's where I finished before I went to high school and uh, I went to a high school called Lee Jackson which was down near Alexandria then it is now in Alexandria the property has been annexed and uh, when I went to high school my goal in life was to be an engineer, to build bridges, great big bridges. Well, we had a wonderful new teacher come in to that school that year, Martha Reilly, from up in Middletown in the Shenandoah Valley. And uh, it was an oratorical contest put on in the schools back then by the Washington Evening Star and the American Legion. And I won that. And Miss Reilly decided I ought to be a lawyer <laughs> rather than an engineer. And she really was the mother of vocational education in this day. She organized groups of students who were interested in different things. Back in those days, nursing was the big thing for girls. And she would get doctors to come out and talk to those girls, nurses and so forth, take them to the hospital. There was one other, only one other guy who was interested in law, but she got the local uh, police court judge to come out and got a lawyer by the name of Paul Delaney to come out and talk to us. She took us to the, the local courts, the state, the, the police court, and what is now the circuit court, and also took us to the federal court, uh, but she had to wait till he got there. Back in those days, the federal court wasn't very busy, and the judge didn't come up here very often. She also took us over to the Supreme Court in Washington. That's when they were still in the basement of the Capitol building, before they've got the beautiful building they're in now. And they were supposed to be sitting the day we went, but when we got there, they weren't sitting. But they let us go and sit in the courtroom. And, and, but that was, that was her goal, was to convince me to be a lawyer, and it took. <laughs> so what, what was it that she saw in you, do you think, that made her want to push you in that field? Well, uh, she heard me speak. Mm. And uh, I guess she thought anybody who could speak ought to be a lawyer. <laughs> Were you in a, a certain club, or was this a debate group, the reason she heard you speak? Well, yeah, yes. It, it was a, well, it, in the local school, it was just a, a student body, but then when it was countywide, it was people from all over the county. Mm -hmm. So now, why did you want to be an engineer earlier? I don't know. I just got interested in it. and. Uh, I began looking around where to go. Uh, I didn't have any money, as, as should be obvious. Uh, and I looked into the possibility of uh, one of the academies 
Uh, matter of fact, my dad took me over to Annapolis, the Naval Academy, and I thought that was great. Then I found out, though, that I had to know a congressman or, or senator to get a recommendation to go there. And back in those days, I didn't know any congressmen or senators. So I got interested in VMI and uh, figured that maybe I could uh, find some way to go there. That's interesting. Well, after you finished high school, you decided to take a different course than your brother. He went to UVA, but you went. Well, I wanted to go to UVA too, but all I had was a $175 a year scholarship, DuPont scholarship down there. He tried to find me a job, he couldn't. I went down for a weekend, I couldn't find anything. I began walking the streets of Washington, D.C. And I finally got two jobs the same day. Uh, there had been a man who came to our high school working for M.S. Ginn and Company, which was a stationary place. Still, in, he came selling supplies. And I got, I don't know, friendly with him. And he told me when I graduated, if I couldn't find anything, to come see him. Well, I got to the point where I couldn't find anything, so I went up there. And uh, he took me to the manager, and the manager says, do you mind uh, polishing spit tunes? And I said, no. You mind sweeping the floor? I said, no. He says, you mind running errands? And I said, no. He says, okay. Come to work Monday morning, $10 a week. I went home, couldn't wait for my father to get home, tell him I found a job. So I told him, he says, well, you have an appointment tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock in Washington with the man. If you can get that job, it's where you'll learn something. Through a friend of his who knew about this particular place, uh, the contact had been made. It was a beginning title and insurance company, a one-man operation. They had a part-time secretary and she didn't want to keep working. So I went in. Uh, when I graduated from high school, there wasn't anything to do. You couldn't find a job. They put on a commercial course that year and allowed us seniors to come back and take it, which I had done. So anyway, I go in for this interview. Phil asked me if I can type. I said, yes, sir. You take shorthand? I said, yes, sir. Can you keep books? I said, yes, sir. Now, if he'd asked me how well I could do those things, I would have had to <laughs> not have been quite so positive. But I met him every morning at 7 o'clock. He would tell me what to do. Then I wouldn't see him again until the next morning at 7 o'clock. He was out examining titles in the District of Columbia, the counties in Maryland, and the counties in Virginia. And if I couldn't read my notes, I had time to think up something to put in there, you know, and if I made a mistake on the typewriter, I could get that corrected. And the books weren't too hard to keep, so I, I got by. And that, that grew, uh, well, that was $12.50 a week, too, not 10. At the end of six months, I got raised to 15. And I thought that's about the greatest thing could happen to anybody. Anyway, I then went and enrolled that September in Washington College of Law. Back in those days, you did not have to have, to have any undergraduate work to go to law school. And that was a nice law school. It was created by a woman because of the difficulty she had in getting into law school. But that first semester, Virginia passed a rule that you did have to have undergraduate work to take the bar. What year was this? It would have been about 1935. Anyway, Washington College of Law, which is now the Law School for American University, it was at the southeast corner of 20th and G Streets in Washington, 
George Washington University was at the southwest corner of 20th and G Street, so I just walked across the street in the GW and spent the next eight years. I worked in the daytime, went to school at night for eight years, finally, finally got out. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the uh, teacher in high school was the one who really inspired you to go to law school. Yes. Um, do you think that your work with your father on the dairy farm kind of set you to a, a very early morning schedule for the rest of your life? Yep. Mm -hmm. So seven o'clock coming to work was not a problem. Mm. Mm. And how was that, um, how was it to go to work all day, go to school at night, and then get up very early in the morning? It was hard. It was very hard. It really was. But it was the only way I could get my education. And I worked at any number of jobs along the way to get it. And uh, uh, it, it, it worked out. Now, in my last two years, I was working for a lawyer in Fairfax, examining titles for him. And uh, my intention was to, to practice right there in Fairfax. Uh, when I became a member of the bar in 1941, the town of Fairfax had 950 people in it, and the whole county only had about 30, 35,000. It has way over a million now, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what I wanted, a small town rural practice. And I've never changed. It did. But anyway, uh, as I say, I was examining titles. And one morning, I had an early settlement and uh, finished that and walked across the street to the courthouse to record my papers in the clerk's office. And uh, coming out of the courthouse was a friend who was raised on the farm next to mine, Whitney Clark. And we stopped and spoke. I spoke, I hadn't seen him for some time. And then he says, Harry, are you going to be interested in that judgeship? I said, what judgeship are you talking about? He said, well, didn't you know that Judge Ritchie died at 7 o'clock this morning? I said, no, I didn't know it. I've been tied up over in the office. But I said, I don't have any chance at that. So I went on in and recorded my papers at the counter. And uh, the deputy clerk came in, a fellow by the name of Tom Chapman, I knew, of course. And he says, Harry, Mr. Whalen wants to see you. Mr. Whalen was the, the clerk, the big clerk. And back in those days, the clerk in the county was a very, very important person. I was afraid I'd done something wrong in the record room that he was going to call me on. But I went back there, and he says, Harry, I, see, I want to see you get involved in this judgeship thing. I said, Mr. Wheelan, I don't have any chance at that. He said, well, how about letting your friends worry about that? So he says, let's go see Paul Brown. Paul Brown was a commonwealth attorney. And he had held the judge job before he was, became commonwealth attorney. So we went up to see him and he said, yeah. So anyway. Now back in those days, what is now the district court judges, were appointed by the circuit court judges. And we had one judge for that circuit, back in those days, was Arlington, Alexander, Fairfax County, and Prince William County. Walter D. McCarthy, and he was from Arlington. Well, my friend Paul Brown, the Commonwealth Attorney, went down to see him to tell him I was interested. The Bar Association met. They kicked the other candidate and me out. There were two members away in the service, that's four. The vote was seven to six in my favor. That's 13, and four is 17. There were 17 members of the Fairfax Bar Association back in those days. Anyway, time went on, didn't hear anything. 
Paul Brown went down to see Judge McCarthy again. Came back, he says, I don't know why he's holding up. He says, you know, he doesn't know you. I said, I know he doesn't know me. He says, I think you want to make an appointment to go down there and see him. So I did, scared to death. I went down there to report to the clerk's office as I was told to do. And they took me around, around and sat me in the courtroom. His office was back at the back of the courtroom. Well, I had to wait quite a while. He finally came in and he just nodded to me when he came in the door, went on to his office. They made me wait a while there. Finally called me in. Told me to have a seat. And I said, well, uh, you may have heard I'm interested in the judgeship in Fairfax. And I know you don't know me. I just ought to come down and answer any questions you might have of me. Long, long pause. No, I can't think of anything. So then I tried to think of something to say, and not very successful at that. Finally, I said, well, I thank you for seeing me. I bid you adieu. I went back to Fairfax, went to see my friend Paul Brown, and said, Paul, Judge McCarthy not only doesn't know me, he doesn't like me. <laughs> anyway, time dragged on again. Paul goes to see him again comes back, he says, I just don't know why he's holding up on this thing. I think you better get some petitions signed from people, leading people around the county. Well, by then, I had been, got, had been involved in some civic things that had, had made me pretty well known around the county, and I had a buddy, old retired Marine captain, who took the petitions around and got them signed. Then, still more way, after six weeks, I'm working there in the courtroom, in the record room, one day, and Mr. Whelan comes up to me and says, Harry, Judge McCarthy wants to see you. Well, I looked at him, hoping to see some smiles, mm -mm. glum as it could be. We walked the whole length of the courthouse. He never said a word. So we go in, Judge McCarthy's sitting there, Paul Brown sitting there, I knew why he was there. Or even name Hugh Marsh was there, I knew why he was sitting there. He was filling in till the appointment was made. He wanted to get back to his practice. But then back in this corner was no lawyer by the name of Bob Stump. What little bit of law he practiced, he practiced in Alexandria, although he lived in Fairfax. And I, you know, then that, just that quick thing, what's he doing anyway? Judge McCarthy starts in on me reviewing this whole thing. Talked about the Bar Association. You got the vote of the Bar Association, Bar Association, but only by one vote, so that doesn't mean much to me. He said, you brought some petitions down. Well, the other guys, friends, brought petitions down. So people came to see me about you. People came to see me about you. And he starts on my age. And I'm just going down and down. But finally he says, I'm the last person in the world to hold your age against you. He was the youngest circuit court judge in the state. <laughs> so I get perked up against him. Then he says, but if I appoint you, you're going to get drafted. And I'm going to have to go through this whole mess all over again. And I don't want to go through this whole mess all over again. So he expounds on that for a while. But then he says, you ought not to hold it against a fella if he goes off and serves his country. Besides, I got your friend Bob Stump over here who's agreed to take over for you and give you your job back when you come home. So he says, I'm going to take a chance on you. <laughs> Well, after, we got, after I got to know him, we got to be good friends, I said to him, do you have any idea what you put me through for those six weeks? He says, yeah, I know. I wanted to see if you could stand up under pressure. I said, well, I wish I had known. That's what it was all about. Well, that's so interesting. <laughs> so what, um, what were the civic activities that, that got the attention? Oh, you don't know all that, do you? I had been president of two parent teachers associations. Oh. Although I was neither parent nor teacher, 
put at my own high school while I was still in high school. And then one at a great big, at a great big new high school in Fairfax. Where in both cases the teachers and the parents had got it, gotten at odds and nothing was being done. And back in those days, the parent-teachers associations were very important. The school board would put the building there. It was up to the PTAs to provide the money for erasers and stuff like that, you know. And uh, it was a matter of getting the two sides back together and working together and, and so forth and so on. What now, with, with the one at Fairfax High School, that's when I was working at daytime going to school at night. No, it, it's, it just happened that the same principal and assistant principal who talked to talked me into it when I was in high school also called on me to do it in Fairfax. And I said, look, I, I'm working all day long and going to school at night. I, I don't have time to do it. Well, do it just one year. Well, I did it for three years. And then there was a couple terrible automobile accidents involving high school students uh, at a, over a bridge right outside of Fairfax. And I went before the Board of Supervisors urging them to get the State Highway Department to do something about that bridge. Well, they decided to create a Fairfax County Safety Commission, made me chairman of it. So, and then I, I got invited to speak at any number of parent-teacher associations around the county. And, and uh, I was busy then, too. Now, um, when did you get married? Was it during this period? My dear friend, Martha Riley, moved from the high school that I started out in to the new Fairfax High School, too. My wife went there as the school librarian. <laughs> now, the superintendent of schools, who was a good friend of mine, his wife had another young woman who was just coming there that year for me. But Martha saw to it that I got introduced to Betty Peck <laughs> before I got introduced to anybody else. Why, why is that? Why was, was Martha very interested in you getting introduced to Betty first? She liked Betty really? better than the other <laughs> So how long before, uh, I should say, from the time that you met Betty until you all married? I met her in September. We were married in May. <laughs> and I still had two years left in law school. Wow, wow. So you, the two of you got married, you settled in, in Fairfax, and it seems that she encouraged you then to participate in these things. Your, your um, activity in the PTA, was oh, it in part motivated by your wife's involvement? Well, of course I was already. One of the things I did that year was to put on a reception for those new teachers. There were five new teachers. and. Uh, that was something to get the parents and the teachers together on a, on a social basis uh, and getting them back together. And uh, so, yeah, she was all for the PTA. <laughs> so what year did you all marry? We were married in 1940. Oh. And, um, and your daughter, when was she born? She was born in 42. Okay. And uh, was she also born in Fairfax? She was born in Alexandria. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. There still wasn't any hospital in Alexandria, in Fairfax. Mm -hmm. okay. It wasn't for years and years, and I was appointed on the commission to, to get one created. And uh, we, we finally chose the place, and, and the hospital was built. And it was up when I was involved in the arrangements to come on this court that they had the dedicatory speech. I made a speech at the a dedication of the hospital. Uh, while I was involved in, in seeing whether I was going to get appointed to this court or not. So you really saw Fairfax County grow from farms to this huge metropolis in a very short period of time. 
I was wondering now, after, after your daughter was born, your continued involvement in civic activities, uh, your judgeship, this was, your daughter was born in 42, and of course, we got involved in World War, World War II in December of 41. So what happened to your life at that point? Well, let's talk about December 1941 for a moment. I sat in my mother's living room and listened to Franklin D. Roosevelt ask Congress for a declaration of war on December 8, 1941, and got in my car and drove to Richmond to take the bar examination on December 9th and 10th, 1941. <laughs> it wasn't a good time to take a bar. I was going to say, you had to have been distracted. Yeah, I sure was. It was given over in the Senate chamber. And the members of the Board of Bars and were set up where the crooks sit, you know. And they would go ahead, come back in and say, it's been rumored that San Francisco has been bombed. It's been rumored that submarines have been sighted off the southern coast of California. I mean, we were all biting our nails to begin with, you know. But stuff like that didn't help it a bit. And I was seated up where the President Pro Tem sits, sits right, it's right at the end of that part there. And Senator Aubrey Weaver, who was President of the Board of Bars and was right up there above me. And after we handled in our first exam books, they began reading them. And I'm looking up there, and a Senator Weaver He's got one in front of him. He turns to the person on his right and nudges him. Look at that. They look at it and they laugh. And I was sure that was my book. <laughs> so it was all just a war of nerves. But I passed, thank the Lord. Did you find out whether that was yours or not? Hmm? Was no, I, I didn't, didn't find out. I was just sure it was. So were you notified that day? No, back then, if you gave them a dollar, they'd send you a telegram. And uh, so it got close to Christmas, and I was working in the record room uh, one day, examining titles, and the phone rang and called me. It's a friend of mine from law school uh, who was older than I. He was the assistant trust officer at Washington Loan Trust Company in Washington, D.C. Her trust officer was retiring, and my friend was going to get the job, but he had to get a law degree before he would get it. The bank paid his way through law school at night, and he was he he was order of coif, editor to the law review. He knew at bar review course he knew all the answers. Anyway, I answered the phone. It was Henry. He said, have you heard from the bar exam? I said, no, have you? He says, yeah. I said, well, you passed, didn't you? He said, no. I said, Henry, don't, don't kid about something. He says, no, I failed. Well, I knew if he failed, I'd failed too, so I went back to work. When the secretary came over from the law office to get something, a description for a deed or something, and she heard that the results were had. Sure, she said, have you called? I said, no, I'm not going to call. Henry Lefferts failed, so I'm sure I failed too. He said, oh, dummy, get on the telephone and call. Well, I called my mother. We didn't have a phone, and I left her number. And I said, has Western Union called her? She said, yes. I said, what did they say? She said, they say they wouldn't read the telegram over the phone to me. So I called down there got this woman, told her who it was, and I said, please read my judgment. And she said, no, I can't. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just going down and down. I said, look, I'm way here in Fairfax. I don't get off till 5 or 5.30. Please read it to me. She says, well, all right. Congratulations. You passed the bar. Merry Christmas. I said, would you check that name again? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't. Well, that was quite a relief. And this was Christmas time. December 23rd. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so what happened after that? 
Well, uh, I was, of course, still uh, with the lawyer then. It was within the first year after I graduated that I was appointed a judge. Uh, I graduated in June of 42, and in March of 43 is when I became a judge. Wasn't that, even at that time, very unusual? The age? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. the, the time. Uh, oh, yeah. Within oh, yeah. the first yeah. year. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. what oh, qualities I, have been... I, I was green, don't, don't... And I knew I was green. So what qualities did they see in you? I don't know. <laughs> You, you have to ask them. <laughs> so your experiences just really practicing law and becoming a judge, what was that like, especially you looking back now after your long years of experience as a justice? Well, the practicing law part was examining titles. Where you learn a great deal, you really do but not so much that helps you in a job like I had to begin with. I had been over to that court twice. That's the only time I was in court in that span between June and March. I lost both times. And I learned you don't always take what a client tells you in the office. Because when they get over there and hold up their hands, it's a little different situation. And I was embarrassed both times. <laughs> So my, my experience amounted to nothing, really. One thing I did, I didn't qualify for three weeks. I took the Virginia Code, which back in those days was in one volume. It was a good thick volume like that. That did not occupy the whole shelf like that does. But I, I, I analyzed every statute I thought I might need to apply in, in uh, my work. Made a summary of it put it in a loose leaf book. I kept it on the bench with me at all times. And that was a big help. Mm -hmm. But the older lawyers, they gave me a hard time. They really did. <laughs> Give me an example. Hmm? Give me an example of how they might have given you a hard time. <laughs> well, trying to, trying to get me to do something that I, I shouldn't do, deciding the case. And uh, I had trouble with the police for a while. The old judge had had some bad experiences with some of his children with drinking. And uh, he was convicting people of, of driving drunk. All the officers had to say they smelled alcohol in his breath. And the circuit court judge was upset because he had so many appeals over there. And uh, I just began dismissing them. And both the local chief of police and the lieutenant of the state police came together to see me uh, about these dismissals and saying, what can they do? I said, you can bring me cases or you've got the evidence. And if you've got the evidence, I'll convict. If you don't, I'm going to dismiss them. And that finally got understood. Of course, the circuit judge was delighted that he didn't have he wasn't swamped with all these appeals from the high court. But it was just, a, it just took a while to... <laughs> had one old lawyer that came from Alexandria who was quite a character, he really was. He, he would represent people just for a dozen eggs or some vegetables or something like that. He, he really looked out for a bunch of, of poor people. and. Uh, uh, he thought I was a whippersnapper, which I was, of course. But uh, it, it well, and he, bless his heart, he, he, he had been a judge himself. Uh, what was his name? Moncure. And uh, but we we finally got things straightened out. And when I was going for either a circuit court judgeship or on this court. I don't remember which it was. He had a son who came along. And the son came to see me. And the Alexander Bar Association was due to meet. And he said that his father wanted to go to that meeting, 
but he could, but his health just wouldn't let it. But if I agreed that he, the son, would tell them at the Bar Association that his father, if he were there, would vote for me, I said, no, you go back and tell your father that I appreciate very, very much that he would do that for me. But no, I don't want you to do that. <laughs> That's really interesting. So now, when did you end up going into the military during the Second World War? When did you go into the military during the Second World War? Well, I had rather a high draft number. And uh, because I knew the people on the draft board, they told me if I wanted a deferment, I had to ask for it, but they would give it to me. Well, I didn't want it. I just told them to give me plenty of notice. And they indicated that they were getting around to me, so I, I went in and uh, uh, I got a commission in the Navy. Uh, and <laughs> the, the officer who interviewed me, uh, the Bureau of Naval Personnel, couldn't find anything where they could use a lawyer. And he says, didn't you take up something besides law? I said, well, I took accounting in college. He said, accounting, oh, supply corps, supply corps. <laughs> so <coughs> I was inducted into the supply corps. I went to Harvard Business School. The Navy took over the entire Harvard Business School during the war, went there for five months, brought my family up there, and I found out if you've got a grade over 90, you got on the P list, the privilege list, could stay out later at night and longer on the weekends. I said, that's for me, so I got on the P list. What I was supposed to do once I got the commission, was to notify a man who had been the chief probation officer in uh, Washington, who had gone in the Navy and he headed a special program down at Camp Perry uh, to rehabilitate naval prisoners. They kept them back in the service. And he wanted me to come with him. But he couldn't get me a commission directly. I had to get a commission otherwise, and then he asked to be transferred. Well, in the process, I got involved with a neighbor who was a Naval Academy graduate, regular Navy, who convinced me that if you're going to be in the Navy, you ought to go to sea. <laughs> so I gave up on the, the uh, rehabilitation program and went on. But I realized when I got up there at uh, this supply corps school, I didn't want to, that was the dullest, really, it really was, just as dull as could be. So I called this fellow up and said, are you still interested in me coming with you? He said, yes. He says, I'll put in a request from this end, you go put a request in from your end. And when you do that in the Navy, and I'm sure in the Army, you put in the request, but you must turn it in to your commanding officer, and they must put it on a forwarding end. That goes to the next point up, the next point, point up. And it, it dragged on, dragged on. I called him to see what was going on. He says, I don't know, let me check on it. He called me back, he says, I found out what's happened. Didn't they tell you there at the supply corps school? I said, no. He says, I'll read you their forwarding recommendation. This officer has a GPA of 94.5. We think he will make a splendid Supply Corps officer. Request for transfer denied. <laughs> so they failed to notify you of this. That's right. So I stuck it out and graduated. But one benefit of, of having a grade like that is that you get a choice assignment. Mm -hmm. And I got assigned to putting a ship in commission as supply officer at the Philadelphia, well, it was being built by the Dravo Corporation at Wilmington, Delaware. 
but it was ultimately to be brought to the Philadelphia Navy Yard, so I, I, I stayed at a hotel in, in uh, uh, Philadelphia, went to Wilmington every day until the ship was brought to uh, Philadelphia, and then we moved on it and outfitted it to, to go to sea. That's something. So now, just back a bit. Um, when you were about to enter the military, did you have a choice as to which branch? Yes, yes. So why did you choose the Navy? Well, I don't know. It all was, after that trip to Annapolis, uh, when I was a kid, I already had, always, and, and uh, my mother became an invalid. And we had to have full-time help. And one year we had the mother of a midshipman at the Naval Academy. And he would come to see his mother. And I, that, that's when I got a strong attachment to the Naval Academy. He was a football hero over there. B Bob Havens. Okay. So... How long did you serve in the Navy? 22 months. And were they asking you to continue to serve at the end of the 22? Well, it's too long a story. But I got to the point where I was nearing the time when I would be discharged on the length of time I'd been in. And uh, I was advised by a, a person in the know that there was an order coming out of going to help hold me in beyond that time and told me that if I wanted to get out, I'd better get out before that order came. So I came up to Washington and finally landed a spot in what they call contract terminations. Uh, when the war ended, and it had ended by that time, there were many, many outstanding contracts for supplies of all kinds. And these companies were left with big in inventories on hands and things like that, and they could make a claim against the Navy for what they thought they should be paid. And we, they would be assigned to different uh, the officers in that contract termination section, and we would study them, and then we'd get in touch. Sometimes we would go visit those places, and then we would make a recommendation if we could get an agreement with them. And then we had to present that to a review board, which just like going to court. And you were the lawyer. And I mean, they, they were tough, they really were. And uh, that, that it was interesting. I, I got into things I didn't know anything about, but had to find out about real quick, you know, mm -hmm. in order to handle these cases. Hmm. A lot of it was electronic stuff, which was, Greek to me, and it was amazing uh, the spot that cancellation of those contracts put some of these businesses in. I, I felt very sorry for some of them, mm. but uh, we couldn't always give them what they wanted. Mm. So at the end of that process, what did you do? I went back to being judge. My friend Bob Stump was true as word when I got out of the Navy, he gave me my job back. So were you, do you feel like you were really changed in any way with your experiences in the Navy as you re-entered your position as a judge? Well, I think it's bound to have some effect on you. Uh, but I didn't recognize anything, though, that... No, I, I can't think of anything that I would say that I thought was different because of it. Mm -hmm. Could have been that I just wasn't aware of. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, um, in these early years, did you find that your experiences as a judge were molded by any instructors, whether it was an undergraduate or grad or law school? Um. Well, yes, I think law school does have, have a considerable amount of effect. Uh, 
in the law office I was working in, uh, for the large part of the time, uh, the lawyer's son was there, and he was a perfectionist and a hard master. I worked under him, you see. And uh, boy, he believed in, when we certified a title, he was sure that we had not missed anything. And that was, that was good training. And uh, the father wasn't always that uh, uh, sure about things. The old, the old timers didn't worry so much about things that uh, modern day lawyers have to worry about it. They would go over and sometimes examine the title on the back of an envelope. <laughs> but uh, the, the boss's son did not uh, believe in that at all. And he taught, he taught me a good lesson. Mm -hmm. But also, I think that uh, uh, your contact with other judges, I think that uh, judicial conferences are great things. I really do when you get together people who are handling the same sort of work and find out how they do it and you can see somebody doing something that you think is better and that you ought to apply in your own situation. Did you um, um, have any trouble getting into the mode of writing um, your decisions or... or when really I came on this court? I'm sorry? When I came on this court? No, no, I'm thinking on the circuit court. Well. We didn't write that many decisions. We were too busy. Mm -hmm. Occasionally I would, mm -hmm. uh, when it was a real important case and I thought it was something that uh, I should take the time to do, but really we was, it was a, a very, very busy court and uh, just to keep up with the, the cases was, was a task. Uh, it wasn't like out here where you write an opinion in every case that I was put to the task. And, uh, it, uh, so how long did you serve in this position? After, after you came back from the war, how long did you continue in this I stayed until I was, had been eight years in that job. Mm -hmm. And I then lost out on an appointment to the circuit court. Mm -hmm. I went out in private practice. I was in practice for five years, and uh, uh, rather good five years, but I wasn't happy. Why not? The whole time. Well, I didn't know anything before that except being on the bench, and I just wasn't comfortable on that side of the bench. And then after the five-year period, some of the lawyers in Fairfax came to me and said that they wanted to create a third judgeship, but they didn't want to create it until they had some idea who might get it, would I take it? And I said, no, I can't afford it. That was in September. Then in November, I had a very tragic thing occur to my first wife at, at a Mayo Clinic. And one of the lawyers who had come to see me said, does this change the way you feel about a judgeship? I said, yes, it does. I've got to get where I know where I'm going to be when I need to be there, uh, have some sort of a schedule. I wouldn't get home till 10 or 11 o'clock at night when I was in private practice. I said, okay, we'll go to work. So the time I got back, they were had gotten it through and, and I got, got appointed to that. Tell me about the sacrifice, uh, the reason you didn't want the judgeship. Well, I had had, financially, a good five years. And when I went back on the bench, I more than cut my income in half. And that, you know, <coughs> that's the way things were. And, uh, but I have not regretted it. Uh, It, it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience, and I wouldn't take anything for it, uh, certainly not any amount of money. And I, I just think, you know, somebody's got to do these jobs. And if all of us said, well, I, I, 
I'm not going to give up this income I've got. Uh, it might make a great deal of difference in how how, how our, our public facilities are, are operated. Uh, but I, I've done it because I love it. I, I got my taste of it with my two PTA things and and my safety commission thing, so forth, and it, it, it's just something that I think is it, so very important. And they really encourage young people, and I do, to, to consider seriously involving themselves in, in, in public service of some kind, even if it is just being president of a PTA, mm -hmm. you know. Or scoutmaster. It's a, it, it, it's important and necessary. So taking this job then allowed you to have a, a regular hour so that you could be home with your wife mm -hmm. in the evenings. Mm -hmm. So how long did this go on? How long were you a judge in the you said in the district court? Well, th that was the circuit court. The circuit court. Yeah. A circuit court judge five years. Okay. What were the, your experiences like uh, on the circuit court, and how did they differ? Well, we had a very busy circuit. By that time, uh, Arlington had been split off, so the circuit was Alexandria, Fairfax, and Prince William. Uh, Prince William was still a rural county at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexandria, of course, was a city. Fairfax was suburban. You sort of had to act differently in each of the three places. But it was a real pleasure going to Prince William. It was difficult to start court on time because when you went up there, the county officials made a courtesy call on you every, every time. <laughs> and you couldn't always get in the courtroom by nine, 10 o'clock. And, and their way of doing things was entirely different too. But we had, had uh, especially in Fairfax, uh, growing dockets, uh, not just in number of cases, but in difficulty in cases, and uh, uh, the length of time that they took. And that advanced, has advanced over the years, as you know, that Fairfax now has, I've forgotten how many judges on circuit court. But uh, it also was good experience for coming down here. So you said that uh, the way that, that they operated in Fairfax or, where was it, Fairfax or Alexandria or Prince? Alexandria, Fairfax, and Prince William. So which one operated very differently? Or are you saying that the circuit court operated differently, entirely differently? Well, not that it operated differently. It was just different atmospheres. Explain that. And uh, uh, Alexandra was sort of citified, and uh, there was just a different atmosphere there. Fairfax was a little more relaxed, and uh, uh, but it was a different atmosphere from Alexandra. Prince William different from the other two because it was still rural. Things didn't move as fast. Uh, didn't have as many cases. It was rare that you didn't finish a case in a day. Uh, although I picked up a case almost within a month or so or two after I came on the circuit court that I kept until the last day I was on the circuit court. It was a, uh, a receivership case involving what is now the city of Manassas Park. There were 523 lots in that development. A uh, hundred houses were at a stage of development fairly long, another hundred in a different stage and so forth and so on. Uh, when I went up there on the first day that uh, uh, I was to consider the case and to convene all the lawyers, there were 48 lawyers in the courtroom, all with claims of course. If we had made a distribution at that time, the general creditors would have gotten nothing. 
by the time we ended the case, they got 80% on the dollar, which was pretty good. But uh, uh, it was because, I think, the lawyers were willing to cooperate. I, 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 I set a date to try any number of cases. Where the countries have to prove their, their cases and so forth. The receiver was trying to avoid having to pay and so forth. Get up there and we get to negotiating and so forth. Get it settled. And that's, that's, that's the way it ultimately ended. Uh, we were able to get some money in from a person who was involved in the original development who had some money. And we were able to retrieve some assets uh, that he had put in his own name. And when we got those back in, in the, to the receivership, uh, we were able to pay off. At this particular time, did you have um, a secretary who had been working with you for a while, or, or were you constantly in flux with your staff? The three judges had one secretary, and she'd been with the, with the first judge uh -huh. from the time he became judge almost. Okay. A lo local young woman, excellent secretary, uh -huh. Eleanor Chesley. So th all of you shared then this one secretary? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so tell me what happened after this, these five years. Well, Justice Willis Miller, member of this court, died about Christmas time of 1960. Senator Armistead Booth, who was the senator from Alexandria, called on each circuit court judge in Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, and Prince William to ask if they would be a candidate for this vacancy. We all said no. Why? Northern Virginia had never had mm -hmm. a judge on this court. Now the circuit court judge who appointed me, Walter T. McCarthy, had tried for three times to come on this court turned down all three times. He was bitter. Mm. And we just didn't want to go through that. That was all. It just considered we didn't have any chance. Why come back for something where you didn't have any chance? Why do you think you didn't have any chance? Hmm? Why do you think you didn't have any chance? Northern Virginia at that time was sort of looked at askance by a lot of the rest of the state, that, that, that we really didn't belong. We were more Yankee, I think, <laughs> Virginia. And so you ended up with someone, just as you had early in your career, a patron who pushed your name. Not into this, this here. Not in this period? Mm -hmm. So tell me what happened then. <coughs> well, I told you that there was one member, one party in that Manassas Park thing that had the money. And I just, we had a separate case going on against him. And I decided the case against him. After this vacancy occurred down here, I get a call from the lawyer for that person who wanted to come see me. I said, well, it's not about the case. The case is over and done. He said, no, no, it's a personal matter. I said, okay, come on. He gets here and he says, I have reason to believe that if Northern Virginia is ever going to get someone on the Supreme Court of Virginia, it will be under this governor. This governor was Lindsay Allman. And he said, I want to submit his name to you. Well, every reason I could think of for not doing it, he had an answer to. And I finally said, well, give me 24 hours. Well, the first thing I did was to call all the other judges and to tell each of them what this man had said to me. And I said to each of them, if you're interested, I will support you. They all said no. 
And my friend Walter T. McCarthy, he just laughed at me. He said, if you want to get involved in that mess, you'll go ahead. Well, before the 24 hours was up, and before I'd made up my mind, I found out that my friends had gone to work. And by the time I found it out, if I'd said no, I would have made it embarrassing for them. Now, how did it get out? My wife knew about it, I knew about it, and those other judges knew about it. That's all who knew about it. Draw your own conclusions. My wife didn't tell it. I didn't tell it. And I said, okay, I'm in it. <laughs> but it just worked out beautifully. Uh, the bar associations had a great deal to do with appointments back then, the Virginia Bar Association in particular. And uh, there, there were a lot of people interested in it at the beginning. But with they, they have a larger, the Virginia Bar Association has a larger committee. They, they narrow the number down, then they have a select committee who get down to three names. And then they submit those three names either to the governor. See, if there's a vacancy when the General Assembly is not in a session, the governor fills it to the next session of the General Assembly. If the General Assembly is in session, it fills the vacancy. They were not here, so it was up to Governor Allman. Well, one of the members of the select committee was last year's president of the Bar Association. It was a friend of mine. And he calls me, he says, we've just come back from the governor's office, and your name is one of the th three we submitted to him. And I said, Bob, does that mean I got a third of a chance? He says, no. I think you've got half a chance. Who he said, I friend? took the... Hmm? Who was this friend? His name is Bob McCandlish. Okay. And he was the past president of the Virginia Bar Association. I had defeated him in the Fairfax Bar Association when he and I both wanted to be on the circuit court. But we became close friends after that. Anyway, he said, I took the opportunity to let the governor know that you got on the list on the first ballot. It took several ballots for the other two to get on it. But said, nothing to do but sit back and wait. Which I, you know, I knew. You sit back and wait. That's all you ever have to do. Well, the next morning, I'm in my office, getting close to time to go down to court. And the phone rings. And it was Senator Fenwick from Arlington. And he says, Harry, the governor has given me the honor of telling you that he's going to appoint you to the Supreme Court of Virginia. But you must keep it a confidence until 11 o'clock. If it gets there before then, it will be embarrassing to the governor. I said, okay, can I tell my wife? He said, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. So I call her, and while I'm on the phone with her, the secretary walks in with that day's docket and hung up real quick. And she says, you know something, don't you? And I said, no, I don't know anything. So anyway, she went on back. Her office was down where the other two judges were. So I went down there to meet with them, decide who was going to take what case and so forth. And both of them, she'd gone back and told them that she thought I knew something. And they asked me, and I said, no. I'm still debating today whether I did the right thing. Here are my two best friends who asked me something, and I don't tell them the truth. But I give them my word I would keep it confidential. But I still don't know whether I did the right thing. Anyway, I went on in court trying my case, and the secretary comes in at 11 o'clock with a note and says, I think you better come take this phone call. <laughs> and that was it. Who was on the phone? Who was on the phone? A, a, a newspaper reporter. <laughs> now, um, 
who has really been influential? Because you didn't know the governor. Uh, hmm? You didn't really know the governor at that time. Did the you? governor and I had 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 a handshake one time. The General Assembly came up to Arlington one year, I guess to see how much they needed some help up there, and they had a nice dinner for them and a reception, and I went through the receiving line and shook Governor Almond's hand. <laughs> so who do you think was really influential in, in selling your name and, and the idea of you serving on the court? I don't know. No one has ever. You have to ask them. I don't know. <laughs> have to ask Governor Alm. <laughs> so you never talked with him about it. No, we became real good friends. When he left the governor's office, he came out and bought a house right behind ours. And he and my wife became close friends. And he, he was a great, great guy. He really was. He's a great storyteller. He had some wonderful stories to tell. He was appointed to the United States Court of Customs and Patent Appeals. And highly technical sort of a job. He had one law clerk who was a regular law clerk, graduate of law school, and another one who was more engineering, technical type. And, uh, but he, he, he did all right on that. But he was, uh, no, we, we never discussed it. He knew how grateful I was to him for, for having done it. And uh, they, 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 they gave, uh, they had a nice dinner at the mansion for me when I first came on the court, which I thought was very nice of him. So yeah. your appointment was a first for Northern Virginia. I was wondering what um, what kinds of, of, of uh, events or, you know, what were things like um, for people in Northern Virginia to know that they were finally being represented by you on the court? Well, it was a pretty nice thing, I think. Um, I wanted to be sworn in in the old courthouse up there, the old courtroom, which George Washington had a plan and uh, a part in planning. It wasn't put in use until 1800, the year after he died. But it was where I was sworn in to be a member of the bar and sworn in in the other two judicial positions. But the two other judges said, no, no, we'll use the big courtroom. Well, then we had a blizzard that weekend and we started to call, I started to call it off, but they said, no, you gotta go ahead. Well, my brother-in-law had come all the way from Minnesota here, people, you know, and so we had in the big courtroom, and I said, said well, they're just going to get lost in there. Well, when I went in, I couldn't believe my eyes. Every seat was filled in all the sides and, and back, too. But anybody you know, it was a big deal, Northern Virginia getting a judge on the Supreme Court. And there was a little funny thing happened there. The plan was for the other two judges to go in and open court. The governor had come and Judge Sneed, Justice Sneed had come, who had been a friend of mine since both of us were on the lowest of court. The plan was for them to open court, make whatever statement was necessary, and then tell my father to come get me. And I was standing at the end of a hall that goes from the courtroom right opposite there chamber's door, waiting for my dad to come get me. And all of a sudden there's this roar of laughter. Well, my father was hard of hearing. And Judge Brown, the senior judge, had told my dad to come get me. And my dad didn't hear him. Told him again, he didn't hear him. Finally he says, go get your boy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what prompted the, all the laughter. <laughs> <laughs> your parents must have been very, well, your father, was your mother still alive? She's still time? alive. Well, yeah. your parents must have been extremely yeah. proud. Of well, you. I think so. Now, um, what, what was it like? Because you were only 44 um, coming onto the court. And that was fairly young at that time. 
It was the youngest in a hundred years. Yes. So not what the, was that like? Not the youngest of all. Right. Spencer Roan was the youngest up until then. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, our first uh, Afro-American member was the youngest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, they just made the trans transition so so nice, so easy for me. They really did. I, I'll never forget it. They, they just now. I, I knew, of course, I knew Justice Sneed. Uh, I knew Justice Ianson, who was the next senior to me. Uh, the others I knew do only because I had seen them at judicial conferences. Beyond that, though, not not at all. But but they, they just could not have been nicer to me. It made me feel at home. I would I would say the very first case. I didn't know until that first morning that you found out what opinion you was going to write by drawing slips out of a piece out of a hat. And I didn't know that the author of the opinion conducted the conference and did that by turning to the person on his right. Well, that number one slip was drawn by Justice I. Anson, who was my left, on my left, so I was the first person on his right. It was a rather interesting question, whether you can be convicted of driving under the influence on a private lane. Huh. Well, I'd had plenty of time in preparing for that session of court, because I hadn't gotten into all the other stuff that you get involved with. And I'd read every statute involving the automobile. All of them said on the highway except one. And that was the driving under the influence statute. So when we came back for a conference after lunch, got to this case, Chief Justice Science and turns to me and says, how shall we decide this case? How shall I write the opinion? And I said, well, I think we ought to affirm it. And I went through what I just said, but all these other statutes is on the highway this didn't. Justice Need agreed, Justice Buchanan agreed, Chief Justice Ellison agreed, Chief Justice Bradley agreed, got to Justice Whittle. He was from at Martinsville, nice, just as nice as it could be. At conference, he took down with a pencil every word every other member said on his cases. He would stop you if you got ahead of it. But he puts his pencil down. He says, well, before I tell you how I think this case should be decided, I think we ought to compliment our new member on the way he handled himself in his first case. Well, I felt like getting up and going around there and just hugging him. <laughs> no. That just made me feel so good. It really did. <laughs> but it was unanimous that we should affirm it. Interesting. So um, when you um, sat down and actually wrote your opinions, um, did you have a special way that you would do that? And, and was it difficult initially because of all the, the, the constancy of writing that you had to do? Well, I did my research first, of course. Now we have briefs filed, as you know, which of course we read, we read the record. And uh, then I'd go back and I'm sure everybody else does, and do our own research. Because every now and then you find that the lawyer has said something in the brief about what the record shows, and the record doesn't show it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it'll show the opposite. Or you'll cite a case which he says, says so and so, and you read the case and it doesn't say that. So you, you know, you have to be careful. But once I, I've done that, then I start my writing. And back in those days, I, and for years, I wrote with a pencil and a yellow pad. I, uh, long before the day of a computer, 
But we finally got computers, but nothing was really done to try to get us to use them. But finally one day, uh, uh, Mittendorf comes down, said they had some computers they were taking out of clerk's offices because they're obsolete. I'd like to put one on my credenza. I said, no, oh, I don't want one of them. I said, I don't think I could write an opinion any other way with a pencil and a yellow pad. He says, well, it won't cost anything. The only thing that costs, we've got to put a plug back there. And if you don't like it, we'll come take it out. Well, I let him do it. And it wasn't long before I got the feeling, well, if anybody comes in and tries to take that thing out, they're in trouble. It was amazing the difference that it made. I think it's important to get an opening just right. And I would start with my pencil and yellow pad and write something, roll it up and throw it in the waste basket, run with it. I got the computer. I'd just get started and go right on. And it just it made it made it easier, I think. I think I wrote better. It's more fun, you know? And so I was completely sold. <laughs> well, now, were you one of the first or the first justice to use the computer? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure whether anyone else had them or not. So when was this, in the nineteen mid-1980s or It would later? have been after 1981, was after I became Chief Justice, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you find yourself encouraging the other justices? Oh, well, I think so, yeah. 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 That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> so now, let's, let's go back a bit. Um, your early years on the court. Um, the, and, and actually, let me go back just a step to the circuit court, because when you were a judge on the circuit court, this was the time when Virginia was going through a lot of changes. Uh, you had the desegregation laws, you had massive resistance. Were, were any of those cases, did any of those cases come before you? On the circuit court? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Did any of those cases then come before you? And I know they did while you were, uh, once you uh, were appointed to the Supreme Court. No, not really. Not really? We had two cases involving the Henry County situation, but they were strictly legal, legal questions uh, about whether uh, One of them had to do with whether, whether there had to be an appropriation for public schools or something like that. I, don't, don't quote me on that. I, I'd have to go back and ruin it. Mm -hmm. But it was a, a sort of a sideline matter. That, uh, I mean, of course, we were aware of what was going on. We didn't have any doubt about that. What about the um, other kinds of cases, like the Loving case? You were on, you were, I believe, on the court when that case was Love decided. Mm -hmm. yeah, Loving versus I wrote it. Virginia, right? Huh? So tell me a little bit about that case. Well, I got into it, and uh, I did my research, and I became convinced that the law, as it stood in this country at that time, was still what it had been for years and years and years that the regulation of marriage was a legislative matter for the states. I was buttressed in that in the fact, among other things, that the Supreme Court had denied certiorari in the miscegenation case after Brown versus Board of Education. So I'm saying they consider the right to an education, a public education, as a constitutional matter, but the regulation of matter, uh, marriages is still a matter 
for the state, a legislative matter for the state. And if you read the opinion, that, that's what it is. Now, in recent, in the last five years, Style Magazine, the free newspaper here, came out with an editorial, with a, uh, well, an editorial type article in which it quoted something they claimed I said in the opinion. I didn't see it. One of my former law clerks called me all upset. Well, what the case involved was an order by the circuit court that they had violated the statute and were guilty of that. <coughs> But the circuit court judge, the Judge Zeal from Fredericksburg, had banished him from the state. And I quoted what he said about that. And I said he's wrong. And I reversed him on that. Well, somebody, it may have been that law clerk, I don't know, I didn't ask her to do anything, but somebody must have gotten in touch with the style. And they, they printed a retraction. And the author of that claimed that he had in turn quoted somebody else and that it was somebody else who had gotten it wrong. But as far as, I, as I'm concerned with the case, it at the, at the time it was a scholarly uh, discussion of a legal question as, as I could make it, and, that, that, and that's all it was. Uh, did you get the sense at that time after the decision that this would go to the, the uh, federal Supreme Court? Well, I'm, I, I think I was aware of that. Now, they did a very unusual thing. As I told you, I set aside that part of the order which banished the, from the state. I reversed the trial judge on that and I remanded the case, quote, the case, back to him for him to get that straightened out. The Supreme Court granted certiorari in the case then without a final order in it. <coughs> now, I've been asked recently, you know, why, since they had denied certiorari after Brown, would they then come along and just grab this case just as quickly as they could to take us? Well, they're was a change, obviously, that they, there was the possibility that they, they, they thought that marriage, the right to marry whom you choose, was as much a right as the right to an education. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of. I mean, they were bound to be aware of the fact that in the denied certiorari in that case, that they had decided Brown versus the Board of Education. <laughs> you know, everybody in the country knew that. But as I say, at the time I wrote what I considered to be the law as it stood as a result of the action of the Supreme Court of the United States. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm uh, hearing is that, that your experiences from, the, from early on growing up in Fairfax, seeing the changes in that county, and then being on the court that you witnessed so many different changes in the nation and it kind of folded into your career as a, a justice and eventually the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Virginia. I was wondering if there were any other things while you were just while you were either a justice or the Chief Justice that you saw that were that that stood out as being among the first? Well, a commission on the future was the first. Commission on the future of the judiciary of Virginia was the first. Uh, a mandatory course on professionalism was the first. 
we should give me a little notice so I could have thought of some of these things. <laughs> Well, now you were you were uh, when you were Chief Justice. Um, the court had the first African American and the first woman appointed. Mm -hmm. What? How did that change the dynamics of the court? Well, you know, I just think it was a transition. Uh, it was a bit different from the usual transition, but we kept doing things the way we'd always done them. Uh, they fitted right in. Uh, they, of course, had their own individual personalities, uh, but uh, we welcomed them and uh, it, there was no no problems connected. Well, maybe some of the facilities could, might have been better than we had that we have today. <laughs> but uh, it, it was it, it was one that I I thought that took place with something of recognition of of the 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 importance of it of the meaning of it, all right? Yes, indeed, we, we did. But also that, 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 that they were both the kind that, that walked right into the fabric of the court. Did you notice any changes in the banter that went back and forth, um, especially once um, Judge Lacey was appointed? No, I, I wouldn't say so. The reason I'm asking is um, that a couple of, uh, of your, your colleagues mentioned that um, they thought that things, that, that once a woman was appointed to the court that the, that the uh, men were perhaps more gentlemanly or courtly, uh, uh, maybe uh, tone down some of the banter a little bit. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually trying to see if you felt that way at all. I don't think so. <laughs> well, obviously, when she was appointed, you all had to have different facilities to accommodate uh, her. Uh, and you had to oversee that. Yeah. Um, was that kind of something that you automatically thought needed to happen? Well, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. okay. But I can't remember acting any more gentlemanly before, after than I had before. Maybe I did, but if so, it was uh, subconscious. And, uh, now John Charles Thomas was, he was a, a, bit, a bit different because he was quite outspoken about things and just a different personality entirely. But uh, I, I personally thought these are the two things, you know, that, that uh, have happened. It was considered that it was time for them to happen. It was up to us to accommodate the situation. Were you at all aware prior to the announcement that they were appointed to the court, that they would be appointed? Were you given any foreknowledge? No. No. Mm -hmm. Is that typical? No. No, that is typical. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. now, we, we have no idea right now about who the next new member will be. So when the announcement comes, how are justices informed? Are they asked to attend the announcement ceremony? Well, we may contact immediately with them. And I would arrange to meet with them. Uh, of course, with both uh, Justice Lacey and Justice Thomas, they were here locally. But I've gone to other parts of the state to meet with uh, a new member or have them come here and uh, explain with Justice Kinzer uh, 
we were having judicial conference in Norfolk, arranged for us to have lunch together and, and so we could uh, get to know each other and I could go over the work with her. Uh, and then we had our swearing in ceremony. I was wondering um, if you had any um, memorable stories, funny situations, quirks that you remember from uh, uh, your experiences on the court of different individuals who were who served as justices or chief justices. Well, my first chief justice, John W. Eggleston from Norfolk. He'd not been a judge before he came on the court. Uh, he'd been a member of the Senate and uh, an outstanding lawyer. Uh, and he, he was a rather tight judge. He, he could be kind of rough on the lawyers. And uh, I remember a case, this was when I was early on, a uh, simple little personal injury case. And the sole question in the case is whether or not the trial court had erred in refusing to give an instruction on how, on how the jury should consider evidence that the defendant had some an odor of alcohol on his breath. Well, I'd read the record rather carefully and came to the conclusion he hadn't asked the trial judge for such an instruction. But I was new. I was waiting for one of the older members to ask the question. Well, they went on and on, and it, they didn't ask, so I finally said, Mr. Taylor, did you offer such an instruction? And he turned to his partner, who was sitting over at the council table, and Chief Justice Sackman says, no, Mr. Taylor, you answer the question. Well, he turned to his partner again, and Chief Justice says, no, Mr. Taylor, Justice Carrico asked you the question. You answer it. He turns again. Eggleston comes up off the bench. Do you mean to tell this court that you don't know whether you asked for an instruction or not? Well, I was sorry I'd ever brought this subject up. <laughs> but the very nerve of the guy to come up here without studying the record, or if he didn't remember, he should have remembered that he didn't ask. But Anyway, the Chief Justice had another little gimmick that when we had an automobile accident involved, he always wanted to know which directions the roads ran. And he had kept a state highway map in his desk. And he had to be satisfied he had all that straight before he let the lawyer go ahead and argue. <laughs> and uh, I never forget. We had a case where there were two men from Hopewell uh, in the penitentiary. They had been convicted and uh, with prison sentences, and they'd filed a habeas, petition for habeas corpus. And they had a Richmond lawyer representing them. And they got into a dispute with the lawyer about a fee. The other went backwards, forwards, backwards and forwards. We finally said, okay, we'll have the two prisoners brought here next session to court. You come, Mr. Lawyer, we'll get it straightened out. Well, we go in court, and the prison, prison guards had brought the two prisoners up, set them on the front row, and then they had gone back and sat in the rear of the courtroom. And when we call the case, this lawyer stands up and says, Judge, if you'll just give me a few minutes to speak to my client, it turned out that one of them was his client, only one of them. He says, I can get this straightened out. Well, he goes back and he leans over and all of a sudden that guy comes from the floor with a fist and lands on his chin. Well, if it had been me, I'd have chinned him back. But he just stood up, turned to the court, and bowed. <laughs> In other words, say, it's your problem. Well, Eccleston didn't know what to do. We said, take a recess. Take a recess. 
<laughs> and he finally got it, and we went off the bench. And went out, came back in, found the guy in contempt of court, and gave him another, another how much of a time we could give him. But it just, just baffled Eggleston, it really did, that anything like that could happen in the courtroom. <laughs> then the next senior justice was Justice C. Vernon Spratley. He was just a delightful fellow, he really was. He could stand up in the middle of the floor and quote from Shakespeare, from the Bible, from most anything at length. I mean, we would get together for dinner practically every night, and you know, he was just things like that. And he, uh, he always was coming up with a, a little trick. But he, just, he had a green eye shade that he would put on when he was there on the bench. And he said it was because the lights in the courtroom hurt his eyes, which I bought. But I was sitting on the far end as the junior member, and he was on this side of the Chief Justice. So then I got, we had a vacancy, I moved over to this end, and I found out why Judge Bradley wore that, that eye shade. He did that when he wanted to take a little nap. <laughs> <laughs> Bless his heart. But I guess Judge Sneed is the one really. Uh, he had a great sense of humor. He had always had something going. And his favorite was saying was "No fooling, no fun." And he he particularly picked on Justice I. Anson for some reason. He really did. And. Uh, I'll never forget when uh, he became Chief Justice and Ianson was then the person that would precede him. Uh, Ianson used to have us come down and he, he was in, from Portsmouth, he would take us fishing. After this change that was made and Sneed was Chief Justice and Ianson next, Sneed says, I'm not going out on a boat with Ianson alone, we'll have to have two boats, he on one boat or me on the other one, or we go to lunch somewhere. And we come across the streets. No, I want Ianson to go across first. I don't want him behind me. <laughs> but he was always pulling something like that. And you uh, just never knew half the time whether he was serious or whether he wasn't. But uh, he was always coming up with something. Uh, but. Well, I remember one thing, uh, one case that we were having considerable difficulty with, uh, and Sneed, who was sitting next to me, and I answered this cross, right? Uh, Sneed said, Red, let's have a little light on this subject. Well, I answered halfway to the light switch. <laughs> Some of the light switch before he realized that he'd been taken. <laughs> so we had, we had some foolishness going on from time to time. But I think that one of the great things about the court is the spirit of cooperation that exists on it. Uh, before we got a court of appeals, our docket had gotten in, in very bad shape. Uh, we, we, we did pretty well on the criminal cases, the criminal docket, of keeping it current, but on the civil, we were uh, a three years or more delay. And we made a commitment in 1987 that we would clear that up by the end of 1989. And it really took a, a, a terrific effort by everybody. And I had it all worked out. We're at the November session of 1989. The cases we heard that would clean the whole docket up. <laughs> had the cases all assigned. And then Justice Thomas announces that he's resigning. So I had to do something with his cases. I said, well, all this work, we're not going to make it in time. And I finally assigned them all to myself. Then I got some volunteers, and we got the opinions written and got them down, and, and we made it. And as I say, it was 1989. We now 
in 2007, and we're still in very good shape on our docket, probably as good a shape as any appellate court in the country. But it took cooperation from the bottom to the top and the top to the bottom, and, and just uh, really is a very, very great thing for someone who's responsible, you know, for getting done, to have people like that to do it for you. It's just, just wonderful, it really is. Uh, I wouldn't give anything for the relationships that I've had with the members of the court. That, that, that probably is, is the most noteworthy thing of it all. Well, I'd like to conclude with my final question, and that is that I noticed that you have a bust in your office of John Marshall, and he seems like he's your hero, and I'd like you to tell me why and what impact has his legacy had on you? Well, I, I sort of feel like I've known him all my life. Back when I was in, in school, we had what they call civics class, where you learned about people like him, you know. We don't have that anymore. We had a geography class. We learned something about where you are, where you are in relation to the rest of the world, rest of the world, where they are. All that's gone. But anyway, my prize for winning that oratorical contest in my freshman year in high school was the caricature of John Marshall. You see a caricature up there on the wall? Exactly like that. And I just got interested in it. And I've always been interested in it. And uh, then, as time went on, uh, I got involved with the John Marshall Foundation, and uh, even more so in the last three years since my wife was made executive director of the John Marshall Foundation. Uh, but he is one of the greatest people in this country has ever produced. And I am firmly satisfied and convinced that this country would not be what it is today had it not been for him. He became Chief Justice in 1801. Now, before that time, most people think of him only as a judge. Before that time, he had been a hero of the American Revolution. a very creditable member of the General Assembly of Virginia, an outstanding delegate to the Virginia Ratifying Convention of 1788, a successful diplomatic envoy to France, a very highly recognized member of Congress, and a distinguished Secretary of State under President John Adams. And all those things, he was a self-educated man. He was born up in Fauquier County, where my father's family is from. And there were 10 children in the family. Uh, his father sent him away for one year for tutoring in Westmoreland County. And then for one year, they had an Episcopal rector living with them who tutored him. They lived in a little place called The Hollow which still stands today. It's about halfway between the size of a single-car garage and a two-car garage. And 13 people lived in that hollow for 10 years. If you saw it, as I've seen it, you, it, you think they had to sleep in theirs. But when he became Chief Justice in 1801, the Supreme Court didn't amount to very much. He had never made a decision in any case of any importance. It was sort of an object of ridicule, even contempt. Nor was the Constitution regarded in the high light in which it is today. 
Alexander Hamilton had called it a frail and worthless fabric. But by the time he died in 1835, he served for 34 years, longer than by any other Chief Justice. He had made his had made the Constitution the supreme law of the land, and his court the final arbiter of that law. Thomas Jefferson wanted to impeach him, wanted to impeach the entire federal judiciary. But John Marshall made the judiciary an independent, equal branch of government with the other two branches of government. He believed, he, he was at Valley Forge with George Washington. He was on George Washington's staff and really Washington's protege. And they both came away from Valley Forge believing that that was such a terrible winter. They didn't have anything to eat. They didn't have any way to keep warm. They didn't have any medication. And they didn't have those things because they weren't available, but because the Continental Congress, acting under the Articles of Confederation, was too weak to provide them. And they came away belonging that what we needed was a strong central government. Thomas Jefferson felt the other way. Now John Adams appointed John Marshall in the last days of his time as president, which infuriated Jefferson. He thought it should have been left to him. It had been left to him, he would have appointed Spencer Rowan, R-O-A-N-E, a member of this court, who believed like Jefferson in a weak central government. Now where would we be today? with the weak central government. He's the reason we're not there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a wonderful and appropriate end to our interview. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you. <laughs>